Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello, everybody. We go again. Welcome to a new edition of House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. And just before we start, I think... Um, We'd just like to say a massive thank you to everyone who's been in touch over the last week or so. We've had two unbelievably punchy and powerful stories, um, which we've been honoured to tell. That of Nigel Owens this time last week, um, and of the amazing um, Mark Jennings as well in our House of Rugby Shorts on Thursday. And if you haven't seen that one with the former sales centre, it's an extraordinary story. And um, hopefully we'll fill half an hour of your day and put a, a new perspective on things. He is a brave man. Uh, doing some extraordinary things at the moment, fighting with some deep demons, but uh, turning it into a positive as well. So thank you, firstly, for all the feedback there. Um, And we are delighted to say that this hot streak of top guests just keeps on rolling because Hask is back, obviously, talking of hot guests. Um, And also joining us this week, the smiler, the man who is cricket obsessed. He is a a bizarrely an Aston Villa fan. He loves Elliot Daly. He loves England, Saracens, the Lions. Um, and he loves coffee as well. It is the one, the only, the jolly Jamie George. How are you? Hello. How are you? Give us a little something. How are we, ro- how are we rocking? Come on. Come on. <laughs> Welcome to House of Rugby. Um, we've got one or two hot topics to, to, to chat about this week, and it's very, very nice to have you on. We're going to start, though, with a message that your agent sent me on Saturday saying, I just wanted to check what time Jamie was needed this week as he's planning his golf itinerary. I hope all's well. So you're obviously taking lockdown in your stride at the moment. Oh, for fuck's sake, you stitched me up there, isn't it? Well, it's like, it's the, I love golf anyway, and it's the only sport you can play at the minute, so I thought I'd give it a crack. Good. Are you playing well? Uh, no, I'm actually playing really badly. I was like, I was probably playing the best I've ever played before lockdown, and then I've just absolutely lost the plot recently. Right. Uh, What's your handicap? 15. That's all right. It's tidy. Who at Saracens is top golfer? Saracens or England? Skull Brits was like properly golf mad. He played off single figures. The best, the best golfer I've ever seen rugby player is Ben Spencer. Actually, um, really, he's he's like I think genuinely he wouldn't be that far away from being a professional if he wanted to. Oh, that wow. good, his swing looks incredible. Lucky and he's kid. best mates with um, Matt Wallace. You know Matt Wallace, who's on the tour. Like I mean, he's like what twentieth in the world or whatever. Um, and yeah, he's like. I think he'll probably end up being his caddy. That'll be his career after rugby, which would be pretty happy days. Doesn't he'll seem make to twenty much. times make twenty times as much money at the same time. Half of you ever hit sticks? Or was that not really um, your, your bag, baby? No, well, no, he hasn't. I, no way. I, 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 I have hit a few sticks. I ran into them, if you remember, um, with That's my true. face. Um, no, uh, golfing wise, you know what? I, I decided early on. I did start taking it up, getting lessons. I quite enjoyed it. Used to play a little bit, and then. Um, decided that it was way too much effort, too much hard work, really tiring if you didn't have a buggy. I enjoyed driving the buggy more than I did playing the golf. Um, and and I decided that I was going to get into shooting. So, I'm, you know, that's much more my my vibe, a little, ga- a little day's game shooting. If I was going to give up a day off to do something that wasn't kind of business or anything else, then I, shooting's more my, my vibe, actually. The the major issue there is prob the major issue there is probably that you can't rotate either. That's that's probably yes. Right. H- having watched uh, the last dance we've talked about, my my cigar consumption has gone through the roof uh, is one thing, but more but more importantly, um, my uh, I said to to Chloe, I think do you know what I think it's probably time I take up golf. So she sent a little SOS to Tins. It was like I didn't tell her to do it, but she was like Mike can you teach Hass to play golf? And he came back going, right, he needs to get himself some clubs. So if there's any club sponsors, this is this, because I need some specialist ones. And he went, he's going to need to work on his mobility because he's got the turning circle of a 220 bus. And I was like, brilliant. Um, So that I might, you might see me out of the course, hacking my way through bits and pieces or, but we'll see. I reckon you'd have a bucket and spade in the bunkers. More, 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 more happy in there building sandcastles and digging your way out of it. Um, Jamie, it's very nice to have you on. We've got, we've got one or two hot potatoes to deal with. Are you, are you comfortable with a medium I'm light? Ready, light <laughs> I'm ready, mate. How's life at Sarri's, first of all? Let's, 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 let's start with the big white elephant. Yeah, um, life's, life's great at the minute because we've got nothing to do with it. Um, it. But it's been, I guess that's probably been the most the most positive thing about lockdown really is that um, we've been able to switch off from from everything really. Like mentally, we I think when it, you know, I was saying the other day, pretty much since beating New Zealand in Japan, it's been an absolute shit show 
<laughs> since that. Like it's just been setback after setback. You know, I'm not gonna lie, it's been pretty pretty difficult. So um, to be able to switch off from that and um, you know have a bit of time away, I think is, has been pretty welcomed. Um, we don't really know what it's looking like moving forward. Obviously, I think um, we near enough got our house in order in terms of like people going out on loan and people coming back and um, getting all the books sorted, obviously. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it really. I, I, we're not, I don't see us going back into training anytime soon. So um, yeah, it's not, it's not too bad at the minute. Um, in terms of, I suppose morale and, 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 and what we're discussing there, it, it, has humour seen you through or is it sort of not really a laughing matter? I imagine that 60 rugby players or whatever it is, there's a fair amount of gallows humour that sort of floats around or actually is it sort of beyond that? No, well, I mean, look, I think initially it was, um, but now we can sort of, you know, it's not, I think, yeah, like the only way that any, that, like you said, 60, 60 rugby lads can get through it is, is by taking the piss out of each other and, and laughing about it. Um, yeah, it's been it's been challenging. I think different people have taken it in different ways. Um, but I think you know usually we sort of get over one setback, you laugh about it, and then we get another one. You know, you get ducked thirty five points, get the fine, no worries. We get over that. Then you get relegated. Then you get over that. And then you've got to play pay cuts and all sorts. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm you know you laugh and then you cry and then you laugh and then you cry. It's a bit of a vicious cycle. I can only imagine. Um, and obviously, we mentioned your love of coffee as well. well. You talk about the headlines keep on coming. You didn't join Billy, Alex Good, Sean Maitland and Dominic Cummins on their recent uh, coffee morning. <laughs> um, no, no, I didn't. No, um, I wasn't at Barnard Castle either. Um, no. Perfect eyesight, nah, I imagine. Yeah, those like, they're, they're just, they're idiots. Like some, I have to, you know what a crack was, and you, you pay no. This is not going to last very yeah, long. Yeah. Um, no, but just some rugby lads are just idiot. Like they can't live without each other. So like the idea of lockdown is just so difficult. Um, you know, and they're just the, the worst thing for me is that Sean Maitland's like looking down the lens. So like surely he's realised that someone's gone like, oh, there's there's a load of the Saris lads sat like stood in the middle of St Albans having a coffee. Stupid. I think it's an interesting choice that as well because you know if you list some of the names I mean you know uh, Alex Good made himself the most well-known rugby uh, player in the world for his three-day non-stop piss-up especially around around there and Billy Vinopola I mean you could literally do whatever you could to disguise that like put a tarpaulin over it you could put a false moustache on it you could dye the <laughs> hair on it it's still Big Billy V Anywhere you anywhere you spin it, so I do think it was an interesting choice as well. And St Albans, at least if you're going to go off piece and break quarantine, like do like Dominic Cummings and disappear up to you know some other like a castle up the side of something, or like you said, or wherever it is, get away from get away from it as opposed to doing it right in your hometown. But anyway, madness. Yeah. They got a good yeah, got a fire way around it somehow. And um, the other thing, I want, and I actually like to, I'm genuinely interested in this in a, in a sort of longer term um, discussion. You've got obviously Carter and George as well. Tell me about the biz, how it's holding up, how much time and effort it's taking at the moment, and, and where you're going to be in two, three, five, six, ten months time. Uh, yes, uh, it's going okay. Like the, all the government schemes, have, like we got hit hard by it, but um, we've been lucky to to get some grants. And the government schemes have helped us out, so that's good. I think uh, the best thing for me is that I've actually been able to sort of be, you know, play a pretty major role in the business for the first time for you know extended period of time since we opened really um and we're sort of in a position now where you know we're, we're potentially looking to to take over a new clinic uh, in Hertfordshire somewhere we're looking at a few different sites opening up the second clinic so we're actually probably going to be in a better place coming out of this than we were at the beginning it obviously uh, brings a bit of risk with it as well but um we're actually we're actually in a really good spot so um exciting times and it's been great for me in terms of my development and um you know what i can offer the the business because I've, I've pretty much done absolutely nothing other than put some money into it so, um being able to actually being able to actually like you know add some value has been quite quite good are you actually adding real value or are you doing the photocopying and emptying the bins and making the important no, people not, a cup I'm not of coffee a receptionist no um, no, I'm, 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 you know, we've been, we've had some pretty, pretty big decisions to make and, you know, looking at the business plan of, of opening site number two. So, um, that's sort of been my, my baby during lockdown. Hopefully, hopefully we'll come out of it. All right. What does the business actually do for those that don't know? 
Uh, so it's a physio, effectively it's a physio um, clinic, but we try and run the the professional sport mould and give it to um, the general public. So, you know, most high street clinics is just a room in, in the side of a doctor's room generally. Um, you know, they treat you for half an hour and then give you give you a form with some rehab to do and then you got, go have to pay whatever it is, 60 quid a month to go to Nuffield or wherever it is. And then, uh, and you know, more often than not, no one ends up doing it and you end up back in the same situation before. Whereas we try and keep people in-house. So, um, you know, we've got a gym on site um so our physio works really hard with our um rehab specialist and our pt um it's been going well so far you're not doing hair transplants yet no i know Hask wanted to uh <laughs> yeah i mean the, the rig and the hair the whole the whole thing's falling apart did you have you found that actually setting up the business i know you because you know we talked a little bit about it before was that you know you put the money in and stuff but have you found it actually quite nice to have something else outside of rugby because i know you know i always joke that Obviously, in the introduction, you said that you and Elliot, and uh, you know, you love Elliot, and Elliot loves you. You're inseparable. You obviously you like love to play your ball sports and watch all sports. But is it quite nice to have a business element, something that's completely different from your your day job at Sarries? Like I joke, you know, I, I, I am involved in the business side of things, so um, you know, probably a day a week or a day a fortnight goes towards that. And um, I just I just think like a lot of times as a sportsman, you can carry baggage home, like you know what it's like. Um, when you're getting heat from a coach or you've had a bad performance or training's been shit or, you know, whatever it might be, you know, you always take that home and then you're thinking about it all night. You know, you're supposed to be having a recovery day and you're thinking about it. Whereas this has given me an opportunity to get away from it a little bit more. And I think a lot of people think like that might take away from your performance, but actually it's probably allowed me to focus a lot more on my rugby when I'm in it and then be able to switch off from it more and, and give me sort of a purpose to, to think about something else when I get home. It's interesting you say that about, um, you know, dealing with stuff sort of on the, you know, when you've got negativity or things aren't going well or coaches criticise you, because obviously you're always such a, a positive guy. But, I, I, you know, it's when obviously we'll, we'll, we'll come on to your love of, of coffee later. But, you know, because you always seem so kind of positive and you're very hardworking, you know, do you find sometimes that, that you need to unload those things because of how positive your attitude is. Like, you know, I know we've spoken before when, you know, behind closed doors, you've kind of just gone, you know, what the hell's gone on here? What's this? This is stressful. How do you find balancing that with a positive attitude? Like you said, you can obviously switch off from work, but how do you, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? It's hard. Like I, I, I'm always very aware of, um, you know, my mood and how that transfers across to other people. So, you know, when I'm in the team environment, I'm always very positive. You know, I love being around the boys um, but you know, it's really important for me to have people close to me who I, who I care about, who I can sort of, you know, uh, speak to, I guess, like, you know, I, like you, you know, you we professional sport throws so many things at you. You have, you do have very dark times. I'm a very positive person, but, um, you know, I've had a lot of good conversations. I'm in mean, 2015 with you, mate, like that world cup <laughs> was just like a rehab clinic. Like, I don't know. Like, you know, I was just lying on this. I was lying on a sofa and Hasper was just giving me a head massage. For like 90 percent of the time. Um, but like more recently, like I've had, a, you know, especially in camp, you know, conversations, you know, I have a lot of conversations with Joe Launchbury, me and him are sort of pretty similar minded um, in terms of our perspective on things. And it's great to just have people like that around to, to unload on. Otherwise, you know, it, it can take its toll, I guess. Okay, so we're going to obviously get into coffee. We'll get into salaries, social committees. Uh, apparently, Watson Jackson raised file facts. Fascinated by that. And this sort of bromance with Elliot Daly. First things first, though. You, are you, am I right saying you're nearly 30? Is that right? Uh, yeah, I'm 30 in October, yeah. Are okay, you? So you've got a bit of time. No way, but I thought you were only about Baby space, 24. Mate. mate, I know, honestly. You've been growing that beard since I've known you. <laughs> <laughs> mate, you're like, looking pretty Amish. Like, if I grew this out, I'd be similar to yourself, I reckon. Well, uh, uh, mate, no, you could, there's not enough time in the world for you to grow that out. You've been, you, you literally haven't shaved since I met you. <laughs> It's, it's like you've been, a like just sat in the mirror, tensing my face really hard. Just <laughs> have, you, have you seen those beard growing kits that people are getting now? We've got this old spiked roller, guaranteed hair growth. And everything else. Pena's been on it for ages, and we've finally got this naughty little rugged look. Because since he, you know, he was at Sky, he was like clean shaven, him and his best mate Clive Woodward, absolutely zero chat.com in the suits. Now he's come onto House of Rugby, he's a little bit edgier, he swears, he's grown a beard, he's had his lid taken in. Pena's a different man. Before he was rocking Aaron a high and tight. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. So if, if we could clip that and take that out, that'd be very much appreciated. <laughs> that doesn't need to make the final edit. Um, so 30 years old, because we did something, Jamie, the other day, and um, fair play to you. you it was, we were in a pub with about 200 people or whatever it was, and it, it, quite clear you have a fairly shit time of things. And it was post-World Cup. It was in the middle of the Sarri stuff. Um and it sort of all felt like life had got a bit too much. Where are you now? I mean, 30 years of old, you, you, you know, you, you're trotting around as well as you've ever done. Are you happy, loving it? And, you know, we've got years to go. Or are you planning? What, you know, where are you at with ruggers? Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it as much as ever. Like, I think in a weird way, this um, challenge, I guess you could call it, like the, the whole Sarri situation at the minute, has given me like almost a... a a fresh lease of life. Like, you know, I'm just desperate now to be a part of something at Sarri's where, you know, the whole rebuilding situation, um, you know, whatever happens next season in terms of us being in the championship and, you know, whether how, how much we play or not, I don't know, but, um, you know, being a part of like a young group of of lads, you know, similar to what it was 10 years ago when Brendan Benter first came in, you know, new challenges, uh, you know, that side of it has really given me, like really motivated me to go on. So, I think you're always, you know, whenever you hit 30 um, or come up to 30, it's it's always a bit of a, you know, an eye opener, I guess. But, um, you know, I'm always, I, I, you know, with the whole physio clinic thing, I'm always thinking of stuff outside of a game. But I like to think that I've got I've got a few good more years left in me. I don't know. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I need to keep the rig in check first. That's the, that's the, that's goal number one. Do you think? Um, do you think because of the like the, the joke, jokes aside, the kind of baby faced kind of friendly thing, it, it, you know, and the fact that I didn't even know that you were heading towards thirty, kind of like has held you back a little bit. Because when you when you not in terms of what you've achieved, but just perspective, maybe on yourself and from other people. Because I remember when you know, obviously, you came off the back of the the Lions tour, and you know, seeing you how you play, and also you know, some of the stories you told on House of Rugby about the infamous boxing one, watching how you play now, your physicality, your ability. But because you're just like a, like, well, I call you the truffle, because you're like a smiley little friendly dude. It's like, you know, people forget that you were, you know, that, that you, for a long period of time or at the moment, you're the best hooker in the world, you've done these things and that you're a very tough physical, physical player. But then it looks like if I tickled you under the armpits, you'd laugh. We just give you, you know, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm trying to say? It's like, it, yeah. you're actually way more experienced than you look way more physical than you, you, you perhaps with your, your smiley demeanour. Yeah, I think it's hard. Like, the perception is such a massive thing in life, isn't it? Like, you know, because I have a joke in and around the team room, um, you know, I'm constantly laughing and joking. People think that I maybe don't take things too seriously, but, you know, I'd, li- you know, I'd like to think that I'm pretty, pretty hardworking and um, get my head down when I need to. And it was, always, it was always a thing for me when I was growing up. Like, it was this, that was why I got sent to the fucking boxing club. Because, because like they were like, you know, you're this private schoolboy who's, you know, doesn't take, you know, he's not tough enough. Let's go and send you there so that you can toughen up. Like it was, you know, and then actually, like if you ever looked at my performances, I'd like to think that, you know, I, you know, I, I get my, I get my head down and work hard and, you know, make my tackles, all the rest of it. I'm physical enough, and um, it was always just such a weird thing. And like, you know, even my academy manager at one point said to me, like, when I first broke into the Saris team, he was like you're just going to have to knock Skull Brits out in a scrummaging session. Like, you know, you just got to lay the marker down. You've got to change your perception. I'm like, I'm sat there thinking like, what a ridiculous statement to make. Like, how, <laughs> how am I like, surely you just like, I get judged on my performances and then whatever I want to do afterwards is like the social side of rugby. But that seemed to be an issue growing up. It's, it's changed a little bit now. And like, Sarah's is quite relaxed with that side of things. So that's probably why I, I fit in so well there. Um, but not always with England. Like I felt that a little bit with Lanny, like during that world cup campaign, it was like very much, you know, you're better off, you know, out of sight, out of mind, stay in your, stay in your room. Don't laugh and joking around the team room too much. And you know, I was probably first, you know, it was my first time in camp. So I probably took that probably a bit too more, a bit too seriously, maybe. It is interesting. Sorry, sorry, Al. Just, just to say that with, it, with because I, I've got a confession to make. So, obviously, whenever we played, you know, I, I watching you, for, you know, uh, sitting in the stands on the Lions tour, how incredible you were there, how incredible you've been for England. Some of the, your 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 passing ability, your throwing, obviously, you know, is probably the best in the world at, at, at times. Your ability to run lines, but I've honestly sat down. If you said to me without ever looking at it again, because I never look at anyone, uh, you know, anyone else, I was looking at myself. I go probably, you know, I reckon Jamie's physicality, right? And I, and I, but I would never have said it because I, because I never, it wasn't a thing. If you, if I was going to pull something out of my ass, which is exactly what I'm doing. But I sat down and watched you in the England Six Nations, and I was like, 
what she's smoking into people. I was going, oh my god! Like you know, like it's just it's so weird. It's so weird how you know I, I'm someone who suffered from it more than most, but about that ability to be kind of like judged on appearance. You're one of the most physical people out there, and the way you play, it's just so weird that you like. It, it, your brain plays tricks on yourself and you start buying into something that no one's ever said. It's just because you're always like ha- happy, smiling. And I don't know, because you, you play yeah. like, differently than most front row forwards do. You have much more dimensions to your game. It's just one of those cheap, easy things that people throw out there. Yeah, I just think like the worst thing that you can be in rugby is a fake tough guy. Do you know what I mean? Like the, pe- the person that it gives it the big and before the game, like, you know, all, all talk in the, in the middle of the field. And then like, there are people out there who give it the big end. They, they're like really chopsy, you know, fake tough guys. And then you can't ever get a shot on them because they're the people that never take the ball when, when it's a tough carry. Do you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. that for me yeah. is like, you know, you don't need to speak about being tough. You just get your head down. Either you're tough or you're not. Like Jack yeah. Berger was probably the toughest player that I've ever played with. And he would never talk. He would never say a word and he just lived through actions. And I, I sort of took quite a lot from him in, in that side of things. And, I'm not saying that I'm anywhere near his level, but like, you know, I just, yeah, I think people immediately jump on, you know, they see me maybe being able to like, you know, I like hanging out on the wing and trying stupid shits like grubber kicks and stuff. And people think, well, you know, he surely isn't doing all the hard work. And, you know, I guess. No, but it was I a big, it was a big wake up call for me. Watch, watch, just watching it. Cause I, you know, I'd always like be your biggest fan. And I, and I, I, cause you always think about what some areas to work on. I was thinking I was watching going up. I wonder if it's a physicality and to just see you just absolutely do it, you're know, doing it and being such a stalwart. And then obviously my mind going, James, you're an idiot. You wouldn't be a lion starting front row. Wouldn't be a Sarri starting front row. Wouldn't be an England Sarri, you know, England starting front row if you weren't like the most physically demanding guy. So it's very interesting. Even I fell foul of it and I've never watched, I've never even paid attention to what you're doing apart from <laughs> you, you cut a, you, a mega We've played together for four years. Cheers, man. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, if I would, oh mate, only time I'd listen, you, you, you weren't allowed to throw me the ball, right? I was never going to, apart from, apart from, we were, mate. Yeah, yeah. The best thing is that we had a thing where they wouldn't ever let Jamie throw the ball to. I wasn't ever at line up, but when we do it, it always hit me like double top. We'd be perfect. And he'd just be like this. That's my boy Hask every time. But they were like, no, he's too much of a liability. He's got hand, he's got feet for hands and hands for feet. He's not allowed. I just want to pick up on that thread about the fake tough guys. I know you said you wouldn't name names, but can you can you name names? <laughs> no. No way. I can't no. Name <laughs> Mate, Payno's always trying to get people to reveal. Ask you might ask you might know a few. Like you can't when you're when you're in the game, you can't you can't name names. No, I I, I have you a big you know, I have a massive a massive bugbear for that, um, and I've talked about it before. Just you know, when when you're able to take action, you know, in a physical manner, then that's one thing. All the running in and pushing and shoving without without ever doing anything. Yes, you've got to stand up for your mate, and it's important if you know you get bundled into touch and someone comes in, you've got to be there. But all the whole you know, shout, fuck, you know, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Just, just doesn't like, it's like that Aussie, Aussie man reviews, you know, when he does those comedy things on Instagram and he just reviews yeah, a video. Yeah. It's just a lot of, going, fuck you, no, fuck you, mate. No, fuck you. I just think that's, it's pointless. I would much rather do, you know, uh, a sculpt or whoever it is and go and, and basically just wait until the next time the guy gets a carry and just cut him in half. Or when he goes to clear out, you know, you maybe lead a little bit with a shoulder or maybe there's just a little late swinging arm or maybe there's like, I'm going to leave with my head. Just a little smidgen of that, you know, that, 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 that that's the other way I would do it and deal with it as opposed to talking it up. Oh, I remember doing your game against Claremont when I think Jacques Berger made 195 tackles in the first half alone or whatever. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And it, I mean, it was the sort of defining, his defining performance, certainly in a Sarri shirt. Was he, was he an assassin, not literally off the field, but was he, was he as tough off the field or was he, was he hard on the field and, and gentle and generous off it? Mate, he was, he's like the nicest guy you'll ever meet, like so chilled, loves a beer, like the biggest social chameleon ever, like got on with all the boys. Like you could always see it. Like, you know, if you looked into his eyes, you'd like, you're like, this bloke is a psycho. But like, he would never, you know, he was never one to like give it the big in. And like in training, like, you know, his body was just a mess the entire way through his career. His knee was like, his knee was shot. Both shoulders were gone. His face was basically in like 12 different parts. Like, you know, he, but so he didn't really give it too much in training, but as soon as he would get on the field, it was like something else. And like, you, you talk about that Claremont performance, Like there was, I think he made, I think it was like 35 tackles he made in that game. But like, if you actually, sometimes I get, I, th- I get a little bit lost with stats based stuff. Like I think it's good for some stuff, but not always. But if you actually look at every tackle he made, it was like 35 
huge collisions. Like, I'm not saying they're all dominant, but he flew into absolutely every single one. I'm like, so they're thinking, wow. Quite a player. He was quite a player. Um, uh, actually, I follow him on Instagram. Now, he's now gone bush, isn't he, in Namibia? Just sort of a little bit of bry here, a little bit of game there, a little bit of driving around. I mean, it sort of lives, in, in, given what we're all going through at the moment, he's probably got it better than most. Oh well, yeah, I th- I, he loves it. Like he um, he bought. He's not he's not from a farming background, but I think his wife is, and he basically f- bought the farm near his his wife's family. Um, mm. A couple of years before he retired, and then did some work to it and whatever, and that was always his plan. Um, and I always thought he'd struggle because, like you know, he's I think he's something like six hours from Vintook. Um He's like you know, it's like an hour to the local shop type vibe. Um, but he absolutely loves it. But, yeah, it was weird. Um, checking in with him like he came to the Prem final last year um, a load of the Sa- South Africans and him jumped on a plane and, and came over all the old boys again he was like someone that was always out with the boys with the beers and coffees and um, yeah all the rest of it and you know for him to now go like full recluse and not be, not be within like 100 miles of anyone is, is a bit weird really Probably gone bush. Um, Jamie I want, I want to talk about you I mean Hask mentioned best hook in the world right now um, and I, I think I, no, I can't. I can't think of anyone to sort of to argue with that. I'm, I, you'll you'll frown and you'll you'll bat it away. But how well do you think you have been playing over the last eighteen months, two years? Um, From the Lions, yeah. actually, three years. Yeah, I I think the Lions was a big big boost for me. Really, like I think um, I wasn't first of all. I wasn't really expecting to get on the tour. Obviously, I hadn't started a game for England, um, and I think it just gave me a, a lot of perspective. Like I was, you know, I was playing some all right rugby off the bench for England, but. It probably gave me a confidence boost that you know I could, I could really you know have a go at, at doing something special. Um, I've been happy enough. Like I still think I've got a long way to go. Um, and again, that's that's what excites me about the the future, really. Like and what motivates me to to keep going is like you know I still think that there's there's a lot of potential to to unravel. Um, yeah, so I mean, look, I've been happy enough. Like I've been you know it's been really cool what I've I've been able to achieve over the last sort of few years um if, if i was to ask you sorry uh, if i was to say to you like what 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 do you think you've got to do to improve like where are your areas of improvement what, what would you say they are all over mate like i i i um a big thing that sort of eddie's always said to me um and that's been probably made more apparent from saris as well is like you know i think i'd often um wait for the ball to come to me a little bit like i've got a reasonable rugby brain and I think like, right, well, this is where I'm supposed to be in our attacking shape. Um, and, you know, I'll wait, I'll wait here and then I'll get the ball and it'll be all right. And I'd make sort of six or seven carries a game. Whereas, you know, Eddie's constantly talking to me going like 10 plus carries a game, get 15 carries. Because like, you know, my, he, he says that my point of difference is ball in hand. Um, and he says, like, I don't do it enough. So he's challenging me to get the ball more. And, you know, so I think I've, I've probably got to be a, a bit more selfish and go looking for the ball a little bit more, um, wanting to make the, the tough carries that we've spoken about. But why um, is that? Why, why, do you think it's because, like, you know, when, when I first got out, because of the, the system that Warren Gatlin put in, you know, it was almost like a case of being overcoached. It was like, you know, you knew because you were going the same way in terms of rugby, you knew your position was, so you never wanted to force it. And then later on in my career, I looked at Billy and Mako, and it did, I don't know what structure they're playing, but it was like, Oh, I'm just going to demand the ball. You know, Nathan Hughes demand the ball, and it was one of those things where I realised that I'd been a great team man and doing what was what was part of the system. But ultimately, I wasn't I wasn't helping it. In the same way, I think Eddie wants you to carry so much is that when you look at England, you know, when we're going well, you've got you know five or six carries in the forwards. When we don't do so well, it's right there's Billy, there's Mako, where's the rest of you know you yeah. know what I mean if you do, if you change the personnel. So why do you think that is overcoaching or just not wanting to not wanting to push things or? I think that I've always been like, I've always been really lucky to play for Saris and for England. Like, well, same people really. Like, you know, you, you you look at, you know, you look, you've got next, you've got Mako, you've got Billy, you've got Maro, you know, like you've got Skull Berger and you're thinking like, they're probably going to do a better job than I am. So like, you know, I'll just get out of the way. Um, and I don't know, like, like, you know, like you said, the best, the best players just demand the ball. So, you know, Billy and Mako's GPS stats at the end of games are always often quite low. <laughs> But actually, they make the most <laughs> carries. Their stats after games are, are ridiculous. Like the work rate that they get through. But like they just, they sort of just, you know, they do a lot more than that. But like, you know, they, they put their hand up and they basically put people around them and say like, well, give me the ball and I'll, I'll get us go forward. And I think 
I probably need to start doing a little bit more of that. My favourite was in England with Mako is that I'd, I'd line up and Mako would go, no, 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 get inside. And I wouldn't get the ball. Then he'd move me outside. I was like, Mako, I've just got, just stop fucking moving me around. Let me carry the ball. And he's like, don't relax, relax. And then he'd just run in front of me and he'd be like, and then he'd go, Haskell, fuck's sake, get out of the way. It's like, Mako, I don't want to have to fall out with you here, but please can I have the ball at one, one out of his 10 <laughs> carries. Yeah. Well, mate, imagine having it like with Mako and Billy, it's just so hot. Like they just want the ball the whole time. It's like, it's a blessing, but you know, for you I'm know, envious. Like carry I'm so every jealous. Now and then. I'm so jealous of them. I always used to make note, like notes about you know when I talked to Eddie exactly what you said. You know, being that, that being that selfish, be demanding, look for the ball. And it was like you know, I always I said this to Billy when he came on, and, and we haven't had Macca on, but you know, because I respected what they did and how well they did it. It was almost like making notes, you know, being a bit play more like Billy, be more like those, you know, because those two, yeah. because you know, even though th- their zest for the ball and what they did was 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 great. It, it, it was actually going to help the team, but it's just Brett getting over that hurdle of, of mentally thinking: a, you know, I just got, I've got to clean that rock, or b, I've got to do this. It's, it's really interesting psychology, just giving in and going, I'm going to be more selfish myself, and if I do that, it's going to help the team. It's, it's a hard one for me because I'm always like, you know, try and put the team first and all the rest of it. And it's not, probably not in my nature, but um, you know, I think, like you said, like I think, you know, for Eddie and the Saris coaches to say that, there's probably some merit in it, and I probably need to start start thinking about it a little bit more anyway. When did you get into rugby? Were you were you a big kid growing up, and have you always had a massive head, or is that something that you... yeah, I've always had a, always had a massive head, mate? Yeah, yeah, that's that's, uh, that's a curse. Yeah, cheers, cheers for that pain. No, no problem. Um... So, I'm, I'm, between the two of you, I've got two massive cow heads on my on my Skype this <laughs> evening. It's um, I'm not getting a lot of light from behind you. <laughs> Was it rugby that found you, or did you go looking for rugby kind of things? Do you know Do you know uh... the, the difference? No, I went looking at it. I'm from a rugby family, so like my old man played for for Northampton for a long long time, uh, the bar bars and stuff like that. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, and my uncle, my uncle played for Northampton as well. So you know, I, I've got two older brothers. My cousins all played rugby. I was I was the youngest. So you no, know, we always like whenever we'd meet up, rugby was the main sport. So you know, I went. I started playing rugby from an early age, like six or seven. Uh, went yeah. to the local rugby club and I'm genuinely like you know I do I do love the game like I'm I'm a, probably a, a bit of a nose. Um but yeah, well, yeah. Uh, no I, and I love it like you know and I love watching games like you know I grew up watching every weekend it was like right you know record every game possible and watch it with my old man and you know he, he I've, I've learned a huge amount from him I'd say what position was he he was a scrum half and what position was your uncle hooker Oh, it was a hooker. Okay, yeah. Um, interesting. And and so, did you? Was your dad kind of? Did he? Did he help you into the game, or did he just say? Did you just find it because you were on the touchline and watching it? And yeah, like he, it in so that way? he coached the first team at, at my school, and we like lived on site uh, at the boarding school. So, like my my Saturdays revolved around like running the tee on for the first fifteen. So I like I loved it. Like genuinely, I was like, you know, I'd go down to the local like the the tuck shop at the school, get fifty p mix. And then you know, and Lucas aid, and then bomb it around there, and that's probably why I'm 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 battling now. Um, but yeah, that was that was um, but that was like that was my my sort of progression really. But he never he never pushed me into anything. Like it was always very much like you know, sports sports a massive part of our family. My mum was very sporty as well. Um, so it was always like you know, you don't have to play rugby if you don't want to. I remember like I had to make a decision between rugby and cricket at one point when I was at, when I was younger, um, and and like a few other sports and it, I, I was the one who made the decision to play rugby and um, it was pretty obvious that I was a lot better th- at that than, than any other sport really. So. How good were you at the cricket though? And were you a batsman, bowler? I was, batsman, I wasn't great. I was like, I was like a, a middle order batsman who um, didn't have a great technique but just would like sort of nerdle it around a bit and then heave it every now and then. Uh, no, I wasn't, I wasn't great. I was like a, you know, a pretty average sort of first team cricket, cricketer at school. What, what were the other sports that you were interested in? Oh, sorry. I played I played a lot of hockey at school. It sounds weird because it's like, yeah, I don't know. But um, I, play, I played a lot of hockey. Like, we were, we were a really good hockey school. So um, I always used to, like, my, my old man, that was one thing that he always said. It was like, play as many sports as you possibly can because it's always going to help your, like, your rugby inevitably. And I think, like, hockey, def- playing a lot of hockey definitely built up a good aerobic base. Like, that's probably a, a big thing of mine. Like, a point of difference is that I'm, I'm pretty fit as, as front rowers go. And I think probably a lot of that came from, from hockey. Um, and then like the, the hand eye coordination stuff, I guess came from cricket a little bit. Um, but I, I used to honestly play what, like any, anything I could get my hands on, I do, you know? 
I don't think you. I don't think you quite realise as well when 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 Jamie's kind of underplaying it, how big a noise him and Elliot Daly are are all ball sports. Like I'm talking about, the two of them are like the two of them are like two little lemmings that just walk around, just chatting absolute nonsense about cricket the entire time. Elliot, honestly, if you, I mean, from what you said. You've actually played Daniel Talent, but if you listen to Elliot Daly, he should potentially be playing for England at the moment. They all play, every opportunity they're setting up cricket. They've got mini cricket bats. They've both got a ball in their hand at any one time. You know, when we talked about my career, so I'm the kind of person who go to a team hotel, sit in my room, work, write, read, whatever. These lads will be even if they're playing the next day. We'll go to the hotel bar, get them to put on, you know. Gloucester, Gloucester so on, a fr- on a Friday no, on a Friday night or whatever it is. They love that stuff. On, I've never heard such nonsense talked about, you know, googlies and doing all this kind of stuff. It's just like, you know, honestly, they're, they're, they are, but they're, they're both fantastic hand-eye coordination. Maybe I, I should have spent more time doing that instead of chatting shit and I might have been all right. But, but you know, it's interesting. Do you follow cricket? Do you follow, do you follow cr- cricket, I mean, in depth or not? Yeah, yeah, I, I love it. Like, um, yeah, yeah I, put, I literally like. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't really know what else to say about that. Like, I'll watch any cricket game that's on. Like, um, Norse, I'm, I'm Norse, fan, Norse, yeah. Norse. I'm a Norse. I'm a cricket Norse. Like, I'm a pothole. Unbelievable. <laughs> One to avoid. Um, so, how did you end up at Saris with all the Northampton connections? How, I mean, and at what point did it start to really get going for you as a as a career? I suppose. Uh, well, I, I always grew up local to Hertfordshire, so my old man uh, taught at Haybury School, uh, and we lived on site basically from from when I was born. So, uh, I guess that, that that was the catchment area. I played like count my county rugby for Hertfordshire, so that was the Saracens catchment area. So I, I got picked up there when I was about fourteen, um, and started going down sort of Tuesday nights. It was pretty casual. Uh, didn't think too much of it, and it started probably getting going at around like. 17 18 i think that's usually when you get a vibe from a club whether you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna get a go at it or not um yeah i got my first first deal um fresh out of school which was which was cool absolutely um i've got a brilliant quote i mean because actually if you're looking to sort of come through the the, the hooker factory so to speak to learn from john smith and, and skulk brits is extraordinary but john i've got a quote here so the beautiful thing about jamie is that he does not look the part but i can never keep up with him at fitness i could never run with him he's got an engine that's got no boundaries um i'm not entirely sure that in the latter stage of his career john looked the part either but um you know i mean how useful was it coming through under guys like that, I mean, just incredible experience, talent, know-how, and sort of able to give you the give you the guidance. Yeah, ridi- like ridiculous. Like I'm, I'm genuinely count myself so lucky. Like, you know, obviously starting out, my first year was Skull Brits' first year at Saracens as well. And I think the main thing to say about both of them is that they're both like ridiculously generous and great blokes. Like they, you know, they they yeah. put so much time into me and um, two very different players as well, which I think benefited me massively you know John around the set piece his leadership his physicality and Skulk in terms of you know being Skulk like the, the talent that he was and um his play in the loose and all the rest of it and I try and pay, take different bits from each of them and, you know I was really lucky especially when John first came to the club his first season at Saris he, he played prop that season um so I played with him most weeks as well which again was you know just he was he was a pretty decent prop um uh, but be, him being able to sort of chat to me mid mid game a few bits in and around the scrum a few lessons here and there you know it was just so invaluable i'm bad i'm bad um the scott brits angles obviously obviously interesting given november did you have a hug with him post final or actually did it need a little bit of time and a bit of space and a i'll send you a text when i'm ready kind of thing no no i went i went into their change room after the game um you know they did, they're not they're not ones to sort of rub it in, um, but I you know I wanted to congratulate Vincent Cock obviously I know um, and Skulk so you know I went in and had a beer with them. It, it took me a little while to get in there, but um, yeah, a few deep breaths and, and went in, uh, and it was pretty tough because they were all taking pictures with the trophy and that's that kind of thing, smoking cigars, and our change room was pretty low key. So um, no, it was cool. Like you know, the I was I was. Je- genuinely happy for them obviously i was gutted with the result and you know what what could have been but um you know they're, they're, i'm close to those two guys and you know i was happy for them that's something that is is pretty life-changing so um fair play how do you reflect on it all now uh i'd like to have one more go at it 
Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Like, I think, you know, the, the performance that we put in against New Zealand was was obviously pretty iconic and the way that we played and all the rest of it. And I just wish that we were able to back it up that that, that following week. Um, but, you know, on the on the day, we were beaten by a better team. We got, we got out-muscled on the day. Our scrum was poor. Uh, and that's something that, that hurts, you know, from a personal point of view, because obviously I'm a part of that. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's a tough one to take. But, you know, like I said before, it's it's very much about, you know, even though that that was sort of a, a huge event in my life, I'm always constantly now thinking about, right, well, what's next? Um, and what can I get stuck into next? And, you know, probably when I'm when I'm old and grey or older and greyer, um, I'll be able to sort of reflect on it and probably be a bit more pissed off about it all. <laughs> let bygones be bygones what's really interesting is that when we did this event i can't remember where it was i think it was pre-six nations that we did this event um i said you know you've got another one in you like no i really don't think i do but i just sort of wonder given what's happened with saris and given the fact that life is on hold for most of us for 2020 actually whether you know a, a break at this stage and i know you're training very hard jamie we will put that out there for you but i wonder whether a, you know a break at this stage actually could work wonders and suddenly careers might have another couple of years in them. Yeah, I, I, I think it will. Like, I, you know, very rarely or, or never in, in professional sport as a sort of mid season break like this happened. Um, so, you know, I think it, I think it will put another couple of years on people's careers. Obviously I, I need to try and make sure I keep myself fit. Um, but, you know, I think, I think now probably my perception has changed and I'd like to, I'd like to keep going towards the next world cup. I'll be 32 turning 33 um so yeah you know there weren't too many 33 year olds at the last world cup but hopefully i'm one of them at the next oh, i reckon you're right you've got plenty of life left in the tank and between now and then obviously lions as well have you spoken to gatland given that next year you'll be in the championship is that a conversation or a text message you fired out or have you have you been told that it'll be international based i mean what, what is the lie of the land for potential yeah. lions I, Saris crew I haven't phoned him personally because I just think that you know <laughs> be quite presumptuous and rude, maybe. Um, but um, well, Cruiser has before heading to Japan, hasn't he? Didn't he drop him a little um, of pigeon did. mail to say I'm still available? Cruiser's a different animal, though, isn't he? Like, he's just a weirdo. Snoozer. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, I uh, I didn't speak to him, but um, Mark McCall um, had spoken to him, and and yeah, the feedback was very much you know we'll pick based on the the international stuff. You know, it's a, it's a exceptional circumstance and all the rest of it so um hopefully my name's still in the hat i'm sure it will be um and is, is lions sort of i mean is that the next big hurdle for you is that the thing i don't know if you keep notebooks and stuff but is that the thing that all roads lead towards at this point yeah i mean look when it has you know what the crack is like all leading into a lion's year there's just a different feel to it um there's a different edge to the games there's a different edge to the training camps and i think that that's only natural it's a big motivator for me certainly I think that plus, you know, I've, I've got a huge amount of respect for Luke Cowan Dickey, and I think that I'm going to have to fight really hard to sort of maintain that starting spot for England. So that's something that, you know, is a is a big sort of motivator for me while I'm while I'm in lockdown to try and make sure I keep working hard. So um, yeah, I think that I've got a lot of challenges coming up over the next eighteen months, and um, you know, hopefully I can come out of them pretty successful. Um, let's get. Sorry, Ask, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say, it's interesting because you know what you, you said to, to Alex, because firstly, you, you guys at Saris have, have pulled a, a, a big one over Alex because he says all of you are the nicest people, you know, on the field and off the field to ever be, you know, ever interview and work with. So I don't know what you lads have done. To me. By it. Well, if it's Saris, you've probably given him a backhander, to be honest with you. That's why. <laughs> that's probably why he's... <laughs> Lovely terrace row of houses in St. Albans, course, but, you know, yeah. I still maintain that they're a great bunch of guys. I will, I will say this, though. You know, you're interesting you said about uh, the World Cup and, and, you know, it's been a very difficult time. We started the show. But actually, you know, you said you wanted to be part of something on a rebuild with Saris. But I think also you, you've got to appreciate, A, how amazing that, that period of time is that you've had at that club. You know, saying about, obviously, you know, that you, 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 as a sportsman, you always want to look forward. Obviously, you guys are going through a difficult time. But to think about the amount of stuff you've won, that, that bond of having that same group of players together, you know, all the things that you've done, it's, you know, it's a pretty envious thing to have, you know. And I, I, to be honest with you, I would swap what you're going through now to have had all of that, all of that success. I don't know whether you feel, feel the same, but you do, do appreciate how amazing it has been on that, on that journey you've been on. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm incredibly lucky to be a part of that group. Um, 
you know, I still feel incredibly proud of everything that we've achieved. And I think that it's so special. I think people probably lose sight of the fact that, you know, look, we, we certainly did wrong and all the rest of it. But I think the model that we built in terms of getting homegrown players, um, you know, getting them in from a young age and, and, you know, the group that we managed to, to pull together was, was a special one. And, you know, we, we, I think particularly what we've done in Europe, I think is something that is, is pretty special, probably not seen since those Leicester and Wasp days that you're involved in. Like, you know, the, you know, the salary cap doesn't really come into, come into it when European rugby, does it? Like that's the, you know, you look at some of the, some of the things that French teams are, are playing that, that racing team that I actually watched that racing final from 2016 the other day, Norse. Um, and, uh, like, you know, you look at, you look at their squad in that and, you know, the salaries wouldn't be, they wouldn't be in the same spectrum, like the same spectrum at all. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm still incredibly proud of everything that we've done and I'm, I'm hoping that we can sort of the rebuilding process will be something that, you know, we can, we can get back to and, you know, watching the last dance, you know, maybe we could have a last dance of our own when, when we get the band back together. I love that. It's a hell of a. We we gave that the five stars the other day. Have you have you watched it front to back last dance? Yeah, literally obsessed. Yeah, I've, I've now I've ordered about four four different books on, like you know I've I've ordered is it Phil Jack Phil Jackson yeah the coach I've yeah. ordered his book. I've I've uh, I basically went and ordered three. I've never bought bought any Air Jordans. I went and bought three pairs of Air Jordans. <laughs> sitting down having a few drinks, like size thirteens, obviously classic. Um, Got the Phil Jackson's book. Got uh, Sam. Uh, it's a guy called Sam Smith. Actually, the unofficial autobiography. Because it's interesting. Out in the papers this week, he he claims that the old you know uh, poison pizza was was nonsense and something else was nonsense. That you know that the, the, the just that the last dance was kind of when it says based on a true story. They've obviously smart you know foofed up a few bits. So it's interesting because he's the journalist that wrote the unofficial biography of Jordan and obviously all the different things that go with it. So. I fully. I've smoking the same cigars as Jordan. Like, mate, we're on it. We're on it. Training. It's, have, you got, it's, have you got any uh, any like quadruple XL suits? What about their suits? <laughs> <in that program? laughs> like, what, like yeah, but, any chance of a tailor or what? What's the story like? No, but, no, no. But the thing is, the thing is, you laugh now because fashion's so cyclical. <laughs> At some point, then big suits are coming. But that was the rage: massive, oversized oh, suits, mate. tiny tie knots, tiny tie knots, just big. You know now. You know, no no boot cut cheese. Everything is like tailored to an inch of his life. I guarantee, twenty years from now, we'll be bopping in a big old suit and we'll be coming back in. Like, yes, don't worry about it. Mate, it's so cool. But what about me? What, what's everyone got into the terrible earring? Like, talk to me about the, just a big looped earring. It's like just, but, just to know. clarify, you cannot pull that off, and neither can I. So let's just let's just leave that there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would never. I did actually think should I get the ear pierced, big oversized suits? Because obviously, because I've got terrible gears and I've got the worst fash in the world. I've got a few tiny suits, oversized bits and pieces, just, you know, big cigar, earrings, Air Jordans on. Tell you what, you two in oversized suits, there's some tailors making some serious quoi <laughs> out of the material required for that. Um, actually, funny enough, that leads us very nicely onto the mid show trail. We're going to talk Elliot Daly when we come back, social secretaries. Life at Sarah's as well, we'll pick up on that. But you are listening to and watching House of Rugby on Joe, brought to you uh, together with Guinness. That kind of works. Uh, with me, Alex Payne, alongside Hask and the Sarah's England and Lions ledge, Jamie George. Uh, don't forget to check out our House of Rugby short series, which is out every Friday during the lockdown. 20 minutes of no frills rugby conversation with a different guest each week. And last week, we were joined by the former sales centre, Mark Jennings, as we mentioned at the top of the show, to hear his extraordinary, incredible, emotional journey that took him to the very brink. Have a listen to this. So I, I never knew who my dad was, and I wanted to know who he was. Like I touched on um, in, in kind of my podcast, just saying about all my life, I never had that, that family connection. You know, I never sat around the table to have food. I was an only child as well. So um, all these things were, were alien to me. And I think a dad... I really wanted this this dad figure in my life. I wanted somebody to kind of look up to and, and and speak to. And as I touched on from an early age, I'd always watch these programs that have families in, and I'd be like, oh yeah, I really want that. You know, this is going to happen to me one day. And even you know, I don't know, like two years ago, I still had this in my head because I'd I'd, I'd dreamt about that so much time after time that I thought, you know, this is going to happen. It's going to be the all this pain I've gone through. It's going to be the a happy ending. And um, you know, I had some, had some really dark times, and I and I wanted to know who who she was and uh, who he was. Sorry, and I I asked my mum, and then she obviously said that she was in care when she was younger, um, similar to myself, and she ran away from the care home. Um, 
She ended up at a food bank and there was two guys and a woman there who, who squatted and they just said, you know, you can come, come and stay with us. And she went there and got raped by one of the guys. And to hear that after, you know, I'd got back from rehab, I'd got back from, um, you know, I, I'd been taking drugs and alcohol for six weeks nonstop. And then hearing that as well, was just um, another another arrow in the heart really and I, I described it as I literally felt like my heart breaking too I think that was the biggest thing for me I just wanting to know who my dad was so that is Mark Jennings on House of Rugby Shorts last week and make sure you download the new episode of Sports Pages as well both of you will enjoy this one it digs into the stories behind some of the greatest sports books ever written and this week after the end of the Last Dance documentary it's with Roland Lazenby who wrote the definitive Michael Jordan biography The Life have a listen to this the play he did then in the first game I saw him live is probably still the most astounding play I ever saw him make. It's a block he made of Samson's jump shot at the end of a, of a huge comeback. Michael Jordan soared all the way across the lane diagonally and slammed Samson. This is a seven foot four man slammed his jump shot down with such ferocity. Everybody on press road jumped. Terry Holland, the, the Virginia coach, found himself applauding till he, because the play was just so crazy. 15 years later, this was in early 1983, 15 years later, I was sitting with Michael before a game in Charlotte. And I asked him if he remembered that play. And he looked at me and said, remember it? And the thing that he said was important, he had no idea he could make that play. These things Jordan did with this competitive ferocity startled even himself mm. along the way. So that is Roland Lazenby on this week's Sports Pages podcast, which is out wherever you get your podcasts right now. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Don't forget as well, you can join our House of Rugby Facebook group, close to 45,000 of you milling around in there at the moment. And that's where, amongst other things, you can vote for your favourite House of Rugby moments. Uh, and you can also vote for House of Rugby at the British Podcast Awards, if you so choose. And if we win, Cy and the backstage team will be heading off and collecting the awards right. once again. Uh, <laughs> So do vote for them for a big night out whenever big night outs return. I think it's just Sai. Just Sai will be popping off. It's <laughs> there telling you how he is the creative genius and the inspiration between House of Rugby, uh, behind House of Rugby. So do vote for Sai at the British Podcast Awards yeah. if you'd like to do just that. Um, we've touched on Last Dance. Um, let's talk England and social committee. Is that a badge of honour or is that the turd that no one else will pick up? <laughs> Um, yeah, originally it was a badge of honour. Well, I took it as a badge of honour anyway. Um, now now it's it's just tough keeping the material fresh, you know, like the, the boys are getting more and more demanding. You know, like <laughs> Hask, Hask used to buy into our socials, to be fair. Like he used to, you know, he was he was, he was a believer. Um, but you'd always get heckled for no matter what, even if you put on, you know, the best social ever. Um, whereas now, you know, it is becoming difficult. That I have to say the pre-World Cup, sort of campaign was difficult to keep fresh and you know eddie and faz put a big emphasis on like you know the social stuff and all the rest of it so um yeah it's it's a it's a challenge but one that i'm sort of taking on who, who are the prima donnas who are those that expect private Mar jets Mar um, marla just yes. marla just says no to everything Fordy's just grumpy the entire time like he's like no i don't want to do it like it's just you know like stuff like that. You just like yeah. Uh, to be fair, like you know we we had we had a relatively good buy in, but um, you know you get you get the, the probably the more elderly statesmen. You know you're looking at the Marlers, the Fordies, um, Dan Cole, never keen for it. Like you know those yeah. guys, they're just they're difficult. They're difficult men to please. You know. <laughs> I think it's interesting as well you said about, you know, I think the key thing to being a social committee is if you get the biggest gobshites on side, easy wins, then they'll always fight your corner. Like, I love that win because we haven't really ever talked about it, but Danny Kerr and, and Jamie used to do a great Ant and Deck set up. They would present, they would present, uh, was it Bant and Dick? Or, no, I mean, I might have just made that up. Or, <laughs> no, that was just what you called us, mate. <laughs> Bye, sorry. But they would, they would do, you know, they would do their own, you know, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, proper slideshow performances. You know, do you remember we went and did the Crystal Maze? We did all those escape rooms. Uh, you know, lads are negative for the sake of it, but these boys, 
were incredible. Plus, obviously, we'll come on to the, the, the coffee. But, it, you know, a, a key social secretary done well it is a thankless task because you're never going to please people. And some people are just negative for the sake of being negative. But I was always massively impressed with the effort, especially as well because Eddie loves it. There's a bit of budget. There's always a bit of budget. You know, trying to make, you know, trying to make a... You know, a, a mountain out of a dog turd is quite difficult. But when you've got a bit of funding, it, you know, it's quite good. Um, who is the most enthusiastic? Who is at the front of the bus, wide-eyed and very overexcited? And what is the greatest event you've put on? What wins? Uh, G- Genji always buys in. Like, Genji's all about good the boy. boys. Like, he, he'll always, he always buys in. You know, like, to be fair, like, a lot of that, like, Lewis Ludlam, similar. Like, you know, a lot of the younger lads, they're, they're mad keen for it. And, like, it was quite funny. We put... Um, we went to Cirque du Soleil. We were staying in Kensington, this Six Nations. And, um, like, we managed to get, like, well, however many, what, 30 tickets to Cirque du Soleil, like, really good seats, amazing performance. And, like, um, uh, half, oh, I don't know what you call it, half time in the interval. Um, <laughs> the interval, they, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the interval. Um, Oranges at the, uh, at the Royal Opera House. I love it. <laughs> um, we uh, literally, like, I could look around and, like, this performance was insane. Like, you know, these people were just, like, doing back, like, you know, quadruple backflips into, like, through hoops, all the rest of it was madness. And, like, but it was a little bit arty, you know, like, there was a little bit of, like, you know, you have to get a bit of artistic, artistic license. And Genji, uh, uh, the interval just came out and went, Babs, I'm really sorry, but like this just ain't for me. And just like, walks out. I was like, yeah. <laughs> but, maybe it was a little bit too cultural for a few of those boys. I love it. I want I want watercolours at Penny Hill. I want sort of forty two easels and see yeah, who can yeah, do yeah. the best landscape off the back of it. Um so yeah, I tell me more about oh, oh, I pressed the floor on this seat and just like I've got a dash Someone's recording this. Please say someone's recording this because it's um... can we keep this rolling? Uh Jane, could you um just say a few words? Make sure it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So we have battled through our weekly um technological issues. We've had Jamie's very fine Oompa Loompa impression and we've managed to put another fifty P in the meter. And off we go again. I think we were talking about social secretaries, but I can't actually remember where we were because frankly the last five minutes has been um some of the funniest audio I've ever heard. But um tell me more about, I suppose, yeah, the, the pressures of I, I suppose trying to keep camp fun and particularly, I know you guys have been in England camps at the, in the past, which has felt like a sort of an eternal slog. How much emphasis is put on it now, Jamie, keeping it fresh, keeping you guys laughing, smiling, and I suppose enjoying it fundamentally. Massive really. Like, and it comes from the top, like the, the boss is big on it. Um, you know, like has said, like he, he, he gives us time where he, he actively like, searches me and Elliot out and says like you may need to make sure you get something on for the boys here especially in the World Cup camp like he was he was big on that because that was probably the longest period of time that we had been together um, but it's, it is difficult because you know like Faz is, Faz is like wanting something new on every week and you know like even the most you know I felt like I was working on a game show like I, you know it was like trying to come <laughs> up with fresh ideas every week was just horrendous so um it was, you know, it was, it was additional pressure, but it, it, it's good crack. Like, I, I enjoy doing it. Um, I guess the, the best ones are when you're on tour, really. Like, it all started with um, in Australia. Um, so we were, we, we did the whole Ant and Deck thing and we did an I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here and we got live snakes and spiders in and um, got the boys in a mix with that, which Hask loved. Um, but yeah, like the tour ones are the easiest ones because, you know, you can go, you can do different, like, you know, every city you go to, you do it like a, Elliot Daly does like a, right, these are the coffee shops to go to, these are the best restaurants, a bit of a tourist guide to the to whatever city we're in. And, you know, you can usually find something cool to do, but it's when you're sort of like at Penny Hill for eight weeks, you know, there's not that much around in Bagshot. Um, so, you know, trying to keep that, keep that fresh and innovative is uh, is a challenge. Take the, take the camp to Barnard Castle. It's all kicking off up there. Bagshot <laughs> needs a, a bit of an upgrade on its uh, its tourist attractions. Hask, who are the, who are the guys um, when back in 2016? Who, who are the animal lovers and who are the animal non-lovers? Well, Eddie always encouraged me to be to be myself. So I was always filming little bits of the stuff on the tour and obviously winding up Owen and different different people. Um, and obviously one of the things that you know Dylan was again you know we've talked about his virtues as a captain was, you know, was very much like we want, we want stuff on, do this. And the lads, I couldn't film any of it, but the boys did, you know, I'm a celebrity to get me out of here, a whole load of funny sketches. And then genuinely brought in with through animal experts, tarantulas, obviously in Australia, 
you know, you know, including the rugby fans, 99% of that whole country is designed to kill you. So they were bringing in all this kind of stuff, huge snakes and, and everything else. I remember, I think it was Joe Marler was terrified, wasn't he? He just wouldn't, he wouldn't have anything. He was screaming, but that was, you know, I, I've, I've always hated spiders. But, you know, I was like, look, can, you know, I wanted to hold a tarantula. And these things are massive and they run really quick. And you're sort of like holding it as you're panically trying not to let it run up your arm, run up your face, and they put it on you and put a giant snake around you. So I was actually really relaxed and keen to try everything. Some lads were, you know, because what they did is they obviously had the, the the keepers had them with them. When the boys were standing at the front, they didn't let you know straight away that they had them and they were like bringing them around behind lads' heads. And they would get up like, you know, Joe Marler literally screamed, knocked the chair over, was trying to run out of the room. So there's a few lads who were, you know, really not keen. I can't remember if there's anyone else who was terrified. But it, it was, was um, sweating. I remember it was Marlon Yard's birthday and we made it, we, we did a thing where it was like, like in I'm a Celeb, where you put your hand in a box that you can't see. And um, we, it, to be fair, there were no animals in there. It was like stuff like, we put like jelly and like stupid stuff in there. But like, he literally was like, outright refused and you can imagine all the boys are getting stuck into him and he was like he literally was petrified i forgot that i forgot you did that as well because we showed all the animals and wound him up so much that he assumed that everything in there was going to be animals and wouldn't put his hand in obviously as soon as you tried to bottle out peer pressure basically lads were ready people were ready to pay for his flight home they were like if you're not going to buy in you can genuinely fuck right off now you know we don't want people like you on tour so it was either like do it was either do, you had to do it and, and he was like <laughs> like honestly he was yeah mortified you weren't tempted to do an ollie Mers in his pringle packet what happened with that <laughs> I think he's been Instagram storing it. I don't know. I, I caught. I just not, yeah, I, I'm not really my scene, but I, I caught something on social media. Obviously, a big fan of Ollie Murs, aren't you? I am indeed. <laughs> I think I've got all of his albums to date. I was a big fan of Ollie Murs until he made out that he was involved in a terrorist attack. That I was like, you know, oh yeah, um, that wasn't that was not his finest hour. Oh, no, I remember. I was in that. London at the moment. I was in London at the. I was at that precise time. At, at, near the same area and everything was closing down I'd just been getting physio from Kevin Lidlow doing it and he claimed there was gunshots behind and I was watching it unfold just armed cars after armed car and then it was like I heard shots and it was like actually there weren't any shots there wasn't any terrorists and it's like I know you, under obviously intense environment your mind starts playing tricks but I kind of slightly lost patience for the fake 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 shots but Jamie will tell you do you remember uh, we, we, this is a story of another day but do you remember the guy from the uh was it Zambian um, <laughs> shopping centre? <laughs> Mate, I oh what god, I've, I've, story. can I tell? Can I tell? Can I? Should I tell it? Or, or it's just it's too good? Okay. It's like yeah, you can. Okay, we can always take it out. Fire it away. So, so basically, um, Lancaster got his like team building guy in right, and and he and he came in and he stood up at the front, and and the first thing he did right, there was a couple of slides up at the front and he went <laughs> he played a slide and there was a woman up there and we were like oh god right you know and he was basically supposed to be an ex-head policeman who um you know was talking about team building and everything else you know and the importance of it we had we had a guy from the SAS in there you know all these kind of things we've been in this police riot thing which was a bit of a shambles um and we had this guy and he basically first picture stands up there and he starts talking about this time that he was in uh, Nairobi like, you know that big shopping mall in Nairobi got taken over yeah. uh, and it was like terrorist attack one of the biggest terrorist attacks and we're like, fucking hell, this boy is like James Bond. This is going to be amazing, right? So you put, we think straight away, his picture of this woman is going to be, it's going to be, he's lost it. But he went, there's a picture of my mum. We're like, oh God, his mum's lost. She went, now nah, she, she didn't die. She was just out there with me when we were there. We're like, well, interesting start, right? So the conversation goes that he's, he's at home and his phone goes, right? So he picks up the phone and he's like, hello? And he's like, shoot, right? <laughs> a bit like David Brent. And they've gone, there's a terrorist attack. And he goes, from my wife's, from my wife's face, she knew straight away that the, the family day was cancelled, right? And as he's talking about this thing and he says, um, right, the first thing I did, and we're all thinking, get your body armour, get your gun, this shit's going to be real. He goes, first thing I did was <sighs> find my forensic kit. We're like... <laughs> Your what kit? He goes, my forensic kit. Like, okay, that's not. This is not going right. He's, he's put a mum up there first. Who isn't dead? Right. It's disappointment. Secondly, forensic kit. He's then gone, looked around for my body armor. Couldn't find my body armor. Put my wife's body armor on. Right. And he's basically gone. And, he, and he's essentially driven down to this, driven down to this mall. Right. And his mate. It turns out his mate was inside the mall at the same time. He's like, right, terrorists have come in holding hostages. He goes down to the mall and he, he's got this big armored car that he can't get down park it so he's parked it four miles away useless right can't park it anyway he's walked down and he, he starts telling you about how he hears bullets he says the thing is when bullets are really close to you you don't even hear them and he sure showed a map right and he's like here 
and the malls here, and he goes, they were firing out the windows. I was like, they weren't, mate. They weren't. They were nowhere near. You were there was you were more chance of shooting yourself with your forensic kit. So basically, he goes he goes in there, he goes to the details. And the, the moral of the story is his mate is the saviour. His mate comes running out right of this building with like 20 hostages. <laughs> 20, he saved the day. And instead of his instead of his mate going, you know, fucking hell, you're a hero, he's gone, stop, hot debrief. Um, you know, f- he goes, have you checked all these people for bombs? He's like, no, I haven't checked them all for bombs, you fucking idiot. I've been like, sa- I'm s- saving people's lives. He's like, don't speak, have a bottle of water. And basically, this guy goes back in and, and saves everybody. This guy st- sets outside and he's like, right, I set up a specialist forensic area with like boxes for like evidence. He's basically nothing to do with this terrorist attack, nothing to do with any of it. The upshot of his whole meeting was, under pressure, you need to stop and have hot debriefs, right, where you like download information quickly. Stay hydrated. So at the, at the end of it, like, at the end of it, Tom Wood put his hand up, right? Like, any questions? He went, yeah. He went, if you could have had a gun and gone in there and dealt with it, would you have done it? It's like, oh, no, no, no. It was like, it, it was the most anti-hero, anti-leadership thing. So we just went around for the next four weeks going, stop. Hot debrief. Don't speak to me. I, I put my hand up, right, which is probably why I fucking never played. And asked, was the, was the other guy in the in the, in the from the, the hero not available? Like, could we not get him? Was <laughs> there like a budget ceiling or something? Because the other guy single handedly saved fifty hostages. <laughs> this bloke set up a perimeter, and he was like, he said he handed his assistant iPhone with notes on it, and was like, take notes. And the guy was like making notes, and he was like moving evidence into evidence boxes, organizing people. And his, and his moral of the story was when everyone was getting really busy and running around outside, basically the point was that you always need the heroes, right, to actually do the, the shit. But you need like the organizers and the bu- bureaucrats. And he said his one big moment was everyone was like milling around, not being organized, ignoring his forensic area, not taking notes, not hydrating. And he went, stop, move back. And he said, they knew from the voice, the authority in my voice that they had to listen to me. Mate, the lads, as soon as we got out of the room, the lads were on the fucking floor. I knew that post-rugby I was sorted after that moment. Because if you can sell a talk on being near a terrorist attack and the best thing you did was <laughs> give someone a bottle of water and set up a fucking forensic thing and use your notes, people will pay for anything. God knows how much Stuart Lancaster paid for that. But the bloke was nothing. And Tom Wood could not... Every time he asked a question, but would you have had a gun? No. Would you, if you know, if you'd been a savior? No. Woody was like that. He couldn't get his head around. This bloke didn't want to be a fucking hero. Mate, it was unbelievable. Was it? It was ridiculous. How does, it's so funny. Well, how does Stuart Lancaster handle that? Does he control or delete and say, stop? He knew that he'd messed up on that one. Like he, this bloke was like, because we'd had, we'd, we had had, we did some like weird stuff, but we had had some cool stuff come in, like bloke from the SAS and, and they like they can go one or two ways. Like either you get full buy-in from the boys, or you, it crashes, and he just this bloke just it just became so obvious that he he was he had had nothing to do with like actually anything important. But, but we had we had we had the guy from the um you know the the red De- not the red devils the um what the fight the the stunt planes what are they called. Is it the Red Devils? Red Arrows. Red, red arrows. arrows, right. So we had the Red Arrows, high pressure, high pressure decisions, maneuvers, inches away, completely reliant on your team. The, the concept is, you know, you've got no time to think. You have to deliver, deliver concise information and not be offended that you fucked up because if you fuck up up there, you're going to kill someone, right? SAS, you know, guy working in small teams, you know, delivering messages, un, you know, trusting people, uh, categorically under pressure that they're going to execute their job to the letter because if they drop the ball, all the important things you need in the team and a bloke who will give you a cup of tea. And he, no, the best bit was, the best bit was, after all of the hot pre briefs, he said that someone called him up, his mate called him up, right? And he basically put the phone down straight on him and he went, take a second, five deep breaths, reflect, and pack, pick the phone back up. And it's like, mate, you're, it was the most ridiculous business jargon for somebody that was near enough danger but wasn't really it was more likely to have you know to crash his giant car into a wall than get anywhere near the, the the terrorist building it was a shambles but Stuart never let on but I did every five minutes hot debrief stop think you know <laughs> but mate Woody was the, Woody was the most upset Woody Tom Wood is a guy he'd have relished it 
Yeah, but he's the guy permanently driving around wanting to save someone's life. So if you're in the Northamptonshire area and you break down, Woody wants to get his big 4 by 4 connect you. If there's a terrorist attack, Woody wants to fly in there with some handmade axe he's made and kill the terrorist. He couldn't understand. This bloke didn't want to shoot anyone. It's like, yeah, but if you had a gun, no. But what was if you could go in there? No. Well, what was if you did that? No. It, what it was like that by the end of it, it's like this is bullshit. <laughs> Just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't get sent down there. <laughs> Great days, it, and it, and it paid off as well. I mean, what what's really good is you <laughs> took those lessons it. and it really came together for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to I want to finish with some bits on on Saris because it, it has been it's been a rough old ride, but. Um, I, I suppose some of the I mean, you've got some unbelievable. I, I still maintain that I think the Saris boys are a great, great collective. Um, and you know, you're you're a good bunch of men. And I know you got caught in the crossfire, etc. But you know, how have people like Jackson Ray, who are club stalwarts and have been there for forty five years? I mean, how have they dealt with you know the heartbreak of it all? I suppose um, the sign of a, a good group and good mates is that you're there in the tough times as well as the good times. You know, and like we've had some amazing times together. But I think in a weird way that this whole thing has brought us closer together and it's allowed us to have conversations. And, you know, you talk about sort of like tr- proper conversations and normally rugby teams only ever talk about their cultures and all the rest of it. This is people's lives and people's jobs and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, that side of things, I think there's an element that it's, it's brought us closer together, but look, it's hit, it's hit everyone hard and everyone reacts to it in different ways. Um, but, you know, I genuinely do believe that we're going to come out the back of this, um, in a better place than when we went in and um you know maybe in a weird way you know everything happens for a reason and it's going to be what we needed to maybe propel us back to back to the top of european rugby and obviously one or two heading off obviously george has announced he's off to japan it's good going to japan do they go with a pat on the backside and we'll see you again soon or is there a bit of i don't know is there a bit more in the whatsapp group no, he's obviously always going to get um, sick of the money he's about to earn. Um, <clears throat> but right. yeah, jumping ship. Uh, nah, he um, he always wanted to do Japan, I think, and that was that was something that he's always spoken about. And I think, regardless of what happened, he was probably ready to ready to do that and, and needed a change. Um, there's a couple of other guys going, but you know, the thing is that you know the way that it, the way that it's worked out is that you know people are sort of you know they wanted to stay, you know, that it's, it's not, it's a really difficult time. And, you know, I guess that's the, the difficult thing about it really is that some people are having to leave not out of, not out of choice. Um, but you know, that, and that leaves a bit of a sour taste in people's mouths, but I guess that's just, that's just the way it is. And, and things had to change. So, um, I think that probably the exciting thing is the people that we've got going away and coming back the young group that the, the club's going to be built around for the next 10 years um you know the likes of ben earl max malins jack singleton um people like that are all going away nick Azikwe are coming back and they're going to be a year more experienced um have a taste of something new and then bring it back to the environment and you know we've still got a pretty solid group of players and group of mates staying at the club for next season who will be battling out in the championship and um you know, when you combine that with the, the internationals that will come back and the people that have gone away on loan, you know, I think we'll be in a, a really good place to be back, you know, you know, near the top of the table for the following season if we get promoted. We, we did you have a look? Were you tempted to go and do a little sabbatical or a blast in France um, or some, another premiership club? Not another premiership club, no. Um, you know, I think if I if I had to, then I would have done if I you know, if it meant that um, you know, that was my only option to play for England, then, then I probably would have done. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really have a look because, you know, pretty much straight away, Eddie was saying that, you know, it was okay. And he, he'd probably still, um, pick us as long as we sort of stayed fit and, you know, played in a few games here and there. And, um, you know, we proved our worth to him in different ways. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, that was the big thing for me. And that was pretty much decision made then, um, um and as someone who you know you you we've mentioned already you know you you love the game and um you know you're up for challenges is there part of you that's quite excited about going to Ampt Hill and changing in a porter cabin and going to the Mene field and getting changed in the car park before you play the pirates kind of thing I mean are you up, are you up for a bit of touring yeah I'm, I'm I'm like you know I look like a, a local rugby club player so might as well get in the mix <laughs> Um, no, man, I'm, I'm keen for a couple of away trips, you know, like Jersey away sounds decent, Cornish Pirates away. I'm sure like that bus journey back would be decent. 
um no yeah it'll be it'll be good like i don't know how much rugby you know the international boys will be playing but i'll certainly be putting my hands up for those away games and what about people like i mean because i was I mentioned in the menu about jackson and his um his file facts which which sounds curious at the very least but i mean people like that are going to hold this club together and i presume are determined to get to page 75 of the of the organizer and put in a return to the premiership without too much fuss yeah i think you know that that's the sign, you know, you see people's true colours in times like this. And, and I genuinely believe that everyone has reacted so well and, you know, wanted to be so supportive of Nigel and the club, you know, for everything that they've done for them. Um, and, yeah, the club's going to be built around people like that, people like Jackson, people like Duncan Taylor, Richard Barrington. These are all people who have been at the club for their whole lives and, um, you know, who it means an awful lot to. And I think that needs to remain at the core of what the club's about um you know like i said you then bring in a group of really exciting youngsters who are going to be a year more developed a year more experienced and um you know this group of the, the internationals that we've got as well and i think that we're going to be uh we're going to be in a really com- really good place going forward why the file of facts jacko's just bizarre like he is he is just he's <laughs> he's a weird bloke like he just needs like, i lived with him for two years like he just he needs to be organized like beyond belief like so his file of facts around christmas like to give you some sort of perspective he will like list off all his relatives friends and family like he's got four kids he's got a big family and like he'll like he'll list off like grandma like we, so we basically stole his file of facts before one christmas and he had like a he had a list and it was like grandma ill devo cd wrapped <laughs> like you know do you know what i mean bought tick wrapped tick and he'd like go down and it'd be like all his family and you're like <laughs> like what a, what a random thing and like, that's just how he lives his life and he just you know like this whole um you know like when brexit happened he became an expert in brexit you know these are all like it's just like the way that he is the way that he's built he just you know he has to he can't get his head around some things and he, he you know yeah it's just <laughs> bizarre how's um how because obviously he set up this iced coffee uh, um uh, what's cold it called brew, yeah. uh cold brew coffee he's actually sent me some it's really nice actually i've been using it sort of pre, pre what's it called again this cold 820 brew. cold brew 80, yeah, 820, 80, 80, 20, 80 20 yeah 80 20 yeah he sent, he sent me some it's really nice chloe stole them all and was drinking them all um pre-workout but obviously you've got uh brad barrett's got his uh ticket uh what's Tiki it, Tonga. Tiki Tonga coffee. There's obviously a bit of rivalry, co- rivalry coffee brands coming out of Saracens, isn't there? Yeah, th- that was a bit awkward, I have to say. Because like Brad, had, Brad was established, and like Brad actually like paid to like be the official coffee supplier of the club, and it was like Brad had obviously like, and then Jacko brought in a load of his eighty twenty cold brew and like whacked it in the fridge just to like for the boys, and then Brad was like, you know, like uh, he put a coffee machine in, he <laughs> supplied all the coffee for like you know, for two years and suddenly like Jacko ro- like rocks in. It was, it was definitely awkward. It was kind of is still awkward every now and then like Jacko put on the group, like anyone need any cold brew? And like <laughs> Brad put on the other day, oh, I've got the, t- uh, the Tiki Tonga van at a local garden center. Anyone come down for a free coffee? It's like, it's like weird coffee war. <laughs> coffee uh, wars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw that. I love that. I like, the, it's, it's one up on ice cream wars, isn't it? Have you, cause you're, you're, are you, is it fair to say you're a coffee snob? Like, yeah, massive. Yeah. Okay, what, what are you drinking at the moment? Um, well, I've got like a quite a cool home setup, so um, I've got like a proper machine at home. Um, so I'm getting like that's one of my work ons through through this uh, lockdown is to try and make sure I get I get my latte art up to scratch. That, uh, my day revolves around like taking the dog out and then coffee, pretty much. Nice, it's a good lifestyle. I tell you what's interesting is. Um, with, with Jamie is that you know because uh, Elliot and I you know we, we I actually got I got a good deal with uh, a Sage actually years ago and got um, Elliot his first coffee machine and Jamie was like was I've never seen a man dawdle so much about whether he was going to get a coffee machine whether he was going to do it it was like we didn't pull the trigger he was sizing things up it was such a long delay do you remember you just couldn't get your head around it uh, about what are you going to go for I'm going to go for this one I go for that one so he was a late, he was a late man to it. But even you see the, the real coffee connoisseur Nors hasn't noticed that he's wearing a, a Deus Ex Machina uh, t-shirt from the probably the best coffee shop in Japan, isn't it? Right. Like he's at, you know, he, Jamie's the kind of guy who turns up for a coffee, gets memorabilia to go in and really <laughs> enjoy that that coffee. <laughs> no, yeah. It's a clothing brand as well, you helmet. Like, there's, well, you know, well, <laughs> well. If you're gonna, I love the a little coffee. bit of product placement. So I bought a t-shirt. 
Um, Hask, when we did Japan, what was the app that you that we lived by? Oh, so there's, yeah, there's a fantastic app called Best Coffee, actually. I used to be part of the old uh, London Coffee Guide app, um, really kind of, um, you know, loved it. And then that, they stopped updating and that went redundant. And Best Coffee is basically all the countries in the world. Uh, that there's people that have recommended, but also they go and review stuff. And that really revolutionized the game around Tokyo because they're so keen on their, on their coffee. But actually, Jamie, to be fair, Elliot and Jamie set up, you know, at Penny Hill Park. Um, obviously, the rooms are named after bizarre things like walnut and cherry and blossom and ambrosia and all these other super names. And, uh, and you know, I remember the, the first thing they used to always be in a room called Larch together. So they set up a coffee shop called Brew at Larch. And honestly, it was the biggest business coffee shop in the world. But I'd even get behind the uh, the coffee sh- stuff. It was like boys are flat out, like Jamie was sweating, like piss and sweat, making coffees. Lads were rolling in, going, Jamie, two flat whites, please, chief americano. Coffee's such a big. Um... A big thing like and now now we've got two coffee machines like permanently at penny hill and it's it's a good good setup to be fair who else is in the sort of top echelon of coffee aficionados um, in coffee club man manu tulangi is the best i've ever seen i think like he's he's ridiculous you know we're talking like swans on the top of your flat white like it, mental ben spencer again he's like one of those annoying blokes who's good at everything um uh elliot is brilliant um, a few other lads like myself and Faz dip in like we think we're, we're pretty good we're not quite confident enough to take Elliot on at the minute but you know maybe after lockdown we'll be we'll be decent enough but yeah like, honestly that's that's the good thing about it is that like in Japan especially we, we flew a coffee machine over and um, we like by the end of it we were running like tutorials on like the coffee machine and you had to like pass the tutorial to be able to use the use the machine and stuff like that and like you know, we were all like, you know, <laughs> Sam Underhill actually en- ended up being actually like pretty decent at making coffees, but we still basically said that he wasn't allowed to use the machine just to piss him off. He's that sort of bloke. <laughs> yeah, but but also because because when it, when Dylan was captain, do you know what I mean? Like uh, uh, before, <laughs> if you ever had a coffee machine, lads like a Johnny May would turn up, not know what he was doing, fucking spill yeah. coffee all over the place. Coffee granules, you know, coffee making is like, you know, down to time, turbulence and temperature. And obviously, like, if you don't clean the machine, you don't clean everything, it just spoils everything. And they're, they're like, you're an adult team of professionals, they're like children. At Undernaws would just come, fuck the whole machine up. You come in after him <laughs> and you'd be like, what, what have you done? It'd be like, oh, nothing. You're like, well, what, you haven't cleaned this, you haven't rinsed this, it's not acceptable. This, again, that was grounds to like, be persona non grata if you didn't maintain that machine. I love that you brought in coffee lessons. Like, because at Saints, they had this unbelievable coffee machine uh, set up in the kit. But again, lads just fucking it up, not cleaning the filter papers. I remember opening the water thing full of mould, mate. I was livid, livid with the maintenance. But it's, it is big, like, in a team environment. You like, you know, you, you spend a lot of time in the team room and usually it's pretty boring. But, like, you whack a coffee machine in there and, like, generally people will then sit around, have a coffee, have a chat and... I do think I, like, I'm, I'm a big believer that it brings people close together. Are you going to bring out a little Jamie George brand? Is, is Tiki Tonga got a got another coffee? Can't, uh, can't rival Tiki coffee Tonga. Walk. I can't. I can't do the coffee. But me and Elliot have always said that we wanted to do it. Um, any other business, Jamie? I've really enjoyed this. It's just been it's been really nice to have a proper ramble. Really, I mean, it's it's it's. I just lo- I, you, you're you're a great great raconteur and bon viveur, and um, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on House of Rugby. Hoff, any other business this week? Uh, well, well, actually, I was I did have a, 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 my, my thinking hat on the other day because I saw that uh, Johan Ackerman's not leaving Gloucester. Oh yeah. To go. Um, obviously, we hadn't really covered that because we're not a full rugby Norse podcast. But I thought actually, is that is uh, Di Young's out of a job? I thought he'd be quite good in Gloucester. Um, potentially as a, as a head coach, purely because he wouldn't have to think about any of the off-field stuff that he spent his life doing. I think he'd be quite, maybe quite a good addition to to the Gloucester makeup and put his name into the to the ring for the job. I was thinking that as a little nausey moment. Good plug. Less filling up the bus and more coaching and getting them doing what they're meant to be doing. That is yeah, a good just, shout, actually. Actually, just thinking, being a director of rugby, instead of worrying about how many sponsorship appearances, whether the lights are going to stay on or whether they're going to pay the bills, I think would be quite yeah. interesting. I'd love to see Die Young back in the game sooner or later. Um, Jamie, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm playing golf. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. good. I do like a man who's embraced lockdown. Yeah, just you know, get the handicap down, work on the latte art, train the dog up a little bit, and you know that occupies my day mostly. And just what we're talking about, front rowers who who 
you know, have gone a lot of front rows go into management actually, and a lot of a lot of hookers do actually. If you look around the game as well, have you got any interest longer term in in coaching, in staying in the game, in that kind of thing, or do you think Carter and George and Coffee Club and going on celebrity reality TV shows <laughs> to practice what you preach is is the future? I don't have a profile for that. I'm not like James. Um, now I I always said that I know to coaching. Like I always said you know, once I'm done with the game, I'll be done with it. I, I probably would be relatively open to it. I, I quite like the idea of like a bit of a portfolio career, you know, like having, you know, Carter and George, hopefully will go all right, work two days a week there, might, you know, be able to go in and do a bit of line up throwing coaching or join you guys on the pod a little bit more. Who knows, you know, that, that's, uh, <laughs> these are all, th- you know, I'm, I'm sort of semi looking into it as we speak. Jamie, it's been an absolute pr- privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. No, Come thanks on. very much for having me on, guys. Enjoyed it. Still think that your um your Oompa Loompa impression may well be my highlight of 2020 what so far. A, what a a We've got a lot more mileage to come out of that as well. Um, Just before we go, that's it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to House of Rugby. Don't forget, you can dig into our entire back catalogue on podcasts and on YouTube. And you can talk about your favourite bits and bobs in the Facebook group as well. Uh, Also, quick reminder for sports pages, the interview podcast from Joe. Um, This week with the author of the definitive biography of Michael Jordan. I know any of you who've seen The Last Dance get yourselves over to sports pages now um we'll see you on friday for house of rugby shorts we'll be back next wednesday with the usual guff where we'll have another very special guest tbc at this moment in time until then thank you once again to the hoff thank you to the wonderful jamie george what a superstar um stay well look after yourselves and we'll be uh, chatting to you again very soon love and hugs from all of us bye for now you've been watching the house of rugby on joe together with guinness drink responsibly Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.